Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Okay, sound check in the back. Can I get a thumbs up? Okay. I don't think I've ever actually walked into that kind of a song before and clapping. That was pretty cool. Thank you very much. So let me just tell you first how really, truly honored I am to be here. I was talking to the Secretary of the Air Force last night, and, uh, and she was, I was telling her, hey, I said, I think you hit out of the park today, I heard, and she said, you know, you just can't find a better group of people to be around than an our guardsman. And, and part of one of the many blessings of, of being your chief of staff of the Air Force is that uh, I get to pick a team to be around me, the, the close personal team that works with the chief of staff of the Air Force, and my only criteria for those that I pick for the personal staff is that they have to be somebody I feel like could replace me someday. And I want to start by introducing you a couple of members of my team uh, who are coming up now that I'm on in, you know, approaching my uh, end of my first year as chief and into my second year. Uh, I want to introduce a couple of folks on the personal staff. One of them is Lieutenant Colonel Manal Ibrahim. Manal is, uh, is actually a F-15E weapon systems officer turned ALO and she is from the Connecticut Air National Guard. And Manal is, uh, has been just a spectacular on my team, not only as a primary trip planner, but she's also the head of my strategy division in the Chiefs Action Group. So Manal Ibrahim, I'm not sure where you are, Manal, but thanks a lot for what you do on part of this team. <laughs> and I'd like to introduce my aide de camp. Major, soon to be in a couple weeks, Lieutenant Colonel Shaggy St. Jean from Massachusetts. Shaggy's an Air National Guardsman, intelligence officer, instructor from the weapons school, uh, and it ought to go beyond uh, this crowd that the individual that probably spends the most time with the Chief of Staff of the Air Force is an Air National Guardsman. Such is the nature of this team, so Shaggy. And he keeps me grounded and lets me know what life is actually like in our Air Force for a field grade officer. So Shaggy, again, thank you for what you do for me every day. So speaking of team, I know our Secretary of the Air Force had a chance to come and talk yesterday. Uh, let me just tell you, she is the real deal. I had a conversation with a retired general officer who said, you know, you actually couldn't pick a better resume if you think about it to be a Secretary of the Service than our Secretary of the Air Force, right? One of our first graduates of the United States Air Force Academy uh, goes on to be an intelligence officer, leaves the academy uh, as a Rhodes Scholar, goes on to get her PhD in public policy, serves on President Bush's National Security Council, doing strategy and policy, goes on to be a Congresswoman from New Mexico for nine years, and in her district, of course, is not only Los Alamos Labs, but serving on the House Intelligence Committee, and then most recently, president of one of our leading STEM universities. You actually couldn't pick a better resume. And I will tell you that I'm having a great, uh, just a great time working with her as my, uh, as my executive uh, partner in this endeavor. And so I'll tell you, we are well served. We won the lottery with our Secretary of the Air Force. So let's talk a little bit about So this year we're celebrating our 70th year as a service. And especially now with our Air Force and Army Guard uh, brothers and sisters, you know, we are the folks that led the great insurgency of 1947. Right? And we picked a theme to celebrate this year and this this convention actually kicks off the culmination of a year's worth of activity, all geared towards celebrating 70 years as a service. And our theme that we picked to celebrate, we call Breaking Barriers. Because in fact, that's what, that's what we do in the military. You know, if we didn't already, if, if somebody hadn't already coined the phrase, 
you know, our banner might be bring it. Because in fact, we're the ones that don't see obstacles. We're the ones that see options and opportunities in every challenge we face. And so to kick off my, my talk today, let me start off with just a short video that captures this theme of breaking barriers for 70 years. If you'd roll the video, please. It's easy to find your limits. Eventually, you hit a wall or a ceiling. In the Air Force, we tell our own to aim high. Since the beginning, we've refused to accept limits. We don't hit walls. It wasn't that long ago they said man couldn't fly. In 1947, we broke the sound barrier. The Tuskegee Airmen broke the color barrier. America's women broke the gender barrier. Some walls are inside your head. Some walls are in the minds of others. Intolerance, ignorance, oppression. The Berlin blockade was a wall you could touch. We broke through. More than two million tons of cargo, food, clothing, medical supplies, were airlifted across the Soviet line. The Arctic saw a C-47 Skytrain become the first plane to ever land at the North Pole in 1952. In 1978, GPS was born with the launch of Navstar, and guided defense systems became reality. The first enlisted RPA pilot, the first American female fighter pilot, soon the first female special tactics airman. The Enola Gay ushered in the nuclear era. We've made planes all but invisible. We were the first to parachute from outer space. We have to aim higher because there are no boundaries in this Air Force. We see the impossible. We see things no one else sees. But we don't see walls. Where others see barriers, we see bridges to the future. Hard to cross, dangerous, with no guarantee. But what's on the other side is worth it. It's not greatness or glory, it's selflessness. We don't break barriers for ourselves because to break through is not the end of your journey. It's the beginning of a thousand journeys for those right behind you. Inside every one of us is something so small and enormous, it has the potential to change the world. It's our purpose. Small because it's personal, enormous because of its power. It's been said that the two most important days of your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. Everything was impossible until someone did it. You have sworn an oath to follow orders. Your orders are to look to the horizon. Look to the sky. Space. Dare to see beyond everything we know. The future is waiting for you to create it. Walls are built of fear and doubt. The ones who break through are the ones who never saw a wall at all. Aim high, airmen. So here's what I want to spend some time on with you before we go into questions and uh, hopefully a few decent answers. Um, what does the landscape look like here in 2017? And what does that tell us in terms of the force that we're building for the future? And here's how the time factor works. So I'm privileged to be your 21st Chief of Staff of the Air Force. The force that we're actually fighting with today is the force was based, that was built based on decisions by General Mike Ryan and General John Jumper. Decisions they made actually developed the force that we are using today in the fight against violent extremism and the other challenges we face around the globe. So the question for me as the 21st chief is what decisions are we making today that are actually going to be the force that Chief 24 is going to fight with in 2030? Because if you look at the timeline, Chief 24 
on this year's Brigadier General list and the decisions that Secretary Wilson and I make today are going to actually frame the future and they're going to be the force that that chief is going to go into battle with. And so this connected tissue between what's going on today and how it, in, and how it informs us for what fights look like in the future and what this Air Force needs to be like and what we need to be able to do for the nation is something you spend a lot of time as chief thinking about. So let's talk a little bit about today. So no doubt you've been talking a lot about this. Harvey in the top left corner, you know, first Cat 3 hurricane to hit the United States in 12 years. 19,000 deployed guardsmen. This is the 123rd from Louisville, right here in the top right. And they're loading on a patient. They've got over 1,000 saves credited to them. 1,000 saves. And this is them. <laughs> and this is them loading a patient onto a Coast Guard helicopter in the parking lot of a library. And in the bottom right, you see the 120th ISR group at Otis. And airmen are looking at imagery. And they're looking at levees, and they're looking at, at reservoirs, water reservoirs, and they're actually providing analysis to the Texas leadership and FEMA to watch and monitor so we can make decisions to avoid further flooding in that devastated area. This is just the nature of the kind of work that I know that we have been, you have been talking about over the course of this convention. And of course, we all are watching Irma as it approaches the shoreline this morning. At one point, this was the largest recorded hurricane in history, 5,000 miles wide. And it will be our guardsmen who will be there, who are there, to ensure that our nation can withstand and recover from this storm as it goes forward. Not only, not only are we focused on violence of storms in the east, but we have on record right now over 1,100 fires that are now raging in the western part of the country. And we have 44,000 guardsmen who are engaged in these fires, 33 that have started and are new just in the last couple of weeks. Not only putting out fires here in the homeland, but also engaged putting, fires, putting out fires and covering hot spots around the globe. The reality of the global security environment that we face is it changed significantly for us in 2014. Prior to 2014, we as a nation were almost singularly focused on violent extremism in the Middle East since 9-11. But what happened in 2014? Russia went into Crimea, got active in Ukraine. China started building islands in the South China Sea and militarizing them. We had this little thing called Ebola in 2014. Many of you were involved in that. We look back on it now and maybe think, ah, it wasn't as big a deal, but at the time, you will remember, we didn't know whether we were facing the plague of the 21st century. ISIS came back and we went back into Iraq. All that happened in 2014. And so the framework through which we look at global challenges changed. It went from about 80% focus on violent extremism in the Middle East and 20% rest of the globe to a far more balanced approach which affected the way we build services and offer the military instrument of power against a new framework of challenges. China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, violent extremism. And so now for the Air Force and for the Army, for the Navy, for the Marine Corps, a challenge we face is that with each, as, as the turbulence in the world grows, the demand signal on military power grows with it. And so we've got to continue to balance our op tempo across all of these simultaneous global challenges. And as the chief of staff of the Air Force, I will tell you that there's no shortage of demand for air power. So as we think about the future and the characteristics of conflict and how you build a force now and make decisions that ensures that Chief 24 has the force he or she needs 
to be able to fight and win in 2030, you got to think about the characteristics of conflict. And so I'm going to offer to you very quickly, because I covered these last year, but we've matured our thinking over time on the characteristics of future conflict that I would argue that you and I have got to be prepared for and we have to build a force for. Trans-regional conflict has already arrived. Doggone it, our adversaries are not paying attention to our combatant commander maps. So when we think about the Russia challenge, it's actually not just General Scaparotti that's thinking about the Russia challenge. It's actually UCOM, AFRICOM, SOUTHCOM, NORTHCOM, TRANSCOM, STRATCOM, you get the picture. Every one of these combatant commanders is thinking about the Russia challenge and their contribution to a global campaign. And so as we think about the military instrument and how we apply what Secretary Mattis calls, you know, you have the power of inspiration and the power of intimidation. And one of the things the Department of Defense brings is intimidation. I would offer that what you're doing as guardsmen in support of the hurricanes is also incredible inspiration. But when it comes to the intimidation aspect of this and ensuring that we provide military options to the president as a service that brings global vigilance and global reach and global power, the question we continue to think through is, are we thinking globally? Are we thinking about the game of checkers or the game of chess? Are we thinking about linear activity or are we thinking about being able to bring simultaneous capabilities to bear in ways that would become the deterrent factor in the 21st century because we're able to overwhelm our adversaries at a pace they can never match. Fights of the future are going to be multi-domain. That's not one domain supporting another domain. It's not sitting together. This is, this is the fact that we sense the globe in six domains, air, land, sea, space, cyber, and I would offer undersea. And as we sense the globe, how do we create a common operational picture that allows us to achieve decision speed at a rate that our adversaries can never match? And perhaps just as importantly, how do we then create effects from those same domains through a resilient network so that when some portion of that network may be taken away from us, our response is, got it. I've got all this other capability that I can bring to bear. And so understanding the business of multi-domain operations as airmen and growing leaders that understand how to knit together air, land, space, sea, space, cyber, undersea, all of the various components together is an essential aspect of future conflict that we're going to have to be ready for. I talked about multi-component. We are more interconnected today as, as four services in the Coast Guard than we've ever been. It wasn't that long ago that joint operations was actually deconflicted and sequential operations. I mean, it wasn't, I remember in Kosovo, as an airborne forward air controller, we actually divided the country in half. Navy go east, Air Force goes west, never the two shall meet. But today, we actually have perfected, I believe, this business of combined arms where air, land, sea, space, cyber are all operating at the same time. Where mission commanders today actually have to think about the integration of both kinetic and non-kinetic fires. And sometimes the kinetic fire is actually not the primary fire or effect. Sometimes the kinetic activity is actually there to supplement the real activity, which is non-kinetic. And our young mission commanders today understand this. And so how do we ensure that in the true business of jointness and combined arms, that we as airmen are building the leaders we need that understand the business of multi-component operations? Our strategy of by, with, and through allies and partners actually is fairly clear. And if you think about this as our primary strategic asymmetric advantage against all of our potential adversaries, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, violent extremism, then this is an area that we have got to invest in and think about differently. When you think about potential adversaries 
and ask yourself the question, who are their allies? What are their alliances that they can count on? The answer is, we have them, they don't. And so the question for us in future conflict is, well, how are we thinking about this? There's no place I could point to that perhaps is more powerful in this business than our state partnership program. And there's no better advocate, by the way, for that than your director of the Air National Guard here, General Rice. Matter of fact, I, I love, uh, I talked to the secretary last night, and she said, Scott, I thought he was catfish. The state partnership program and how we think about merging and thinking about allies and partners is gonna be absolutely critical for us in the future. It means we gotta think about information sharing in a different way. And I would submit to you that most of us have grown up asking the wrong question. This is a problem, this is a bigger challenge for us culturally than it is technologically. We could actually solve this technically. But you and I gotta think about this different culturally because we've grown up in an era where the youngest airman, the youngest soldier, who has access to a mouse with a click of the mouse can make a decision on the classification of any document that comes across their desk. Secret, no foreign, click, decision. And it takes the chief of staff of the Air Force to reverse that decision, often through a rather laborious process. So the question we've grown up asking is, what can I share? And it doesn't take long in that discussion when the answer is, eh, probably not much. We gotta change the question. We gotta ask the question, what can't I share? And show me where it's written. Coalition warfare has got to be at the core of what we do, and you won't find a bigger fan for me than the state partnership program that brings that to all to bear. And And we gotta think about speed in a different way. Let's acknowledge the fact that we have actually had the luxury of controlling the pace of conflict over the last 16 years to the most effect. I mean, think about this statement. We are going to retake Mosul in October, announced seven months prior to the operation. There is no better indicator than that, that we felt, rightly so, that we had total control on the rheostat of time. Because there's nothing they could do to stop us. Future conflict may not allow us that luxury. So how do we think about this business of time and adaptability and agility and decision speed and a common operational picture that allows us to stay out in front of our adversary, and what force do we build to ensure that we can fight and win in the future? So here there's a few areas where, I'll just share with you where we have been focused over the course of the last several months. And I know Secretary Wilson laid out for you the five priorities that we've rolled out, and every one of these priorities is linked directly to how to fight and win in the future and how do we, within the United States Air Force, ensure that we're building joint warfighting excellence in all those missions that the joint team relies on us to be accomplished? I'm sure she talked to you about restoring readiness of the force. This is something that, that, that everyone is focused on. I will tell you that just come back from the Middle East, you want to see high morale in the United States Air Force? You go down range where readiness is high. You want to see low morale in the Air Force? you go back and see the bill payer that got to that level of readiness downrange. Or the level of readiness you can find at Kunsan right now. Someone's the bill payer for that and tends to be home station. And you and I don't have the luxury of looking at the conflicts that may come in the future in a sequential way. Because as soon as Vince Brooks, the commander of US Forces Korea, calls and asks for more forces on the peninsula, I can guarantee you that General Lori Robinson is going to call for more forces to defend the homeland. And it's the same force that's going to be tugged in both directions. So how do we ensure that we got the restore the readiness of the force for the United States Air Force? I will tell you that it begins and ends in squadrons. 
That's where airmen arrive when they, when they come out of basic training. It's where we inculcate the culture of being an airman. And so we've been at this now, we've, been, we've, we've visited, we have a team led by a general officer, they've been to 25 bases, they've been to active guard reserve bases, we've got over 18,000 inputs from across the force, we're already acting, and the secretary and I have got our acts out, and we're swinging away at as many irritants as we can, but the most important thing we're doing is we're pushing decision authority back where it belongs. Because what has happened across our Air Force is as we got smaller as an Air Force, we did what, what organizations normally do, you consolidate and you move up in the organization. So we took intelligence officers at one point and we started moving them out of the squadron. We took admin support and we moved them out of the squadron. We took various entities out of the squadron. What happened was we consolidated out of the squadron, but we left the duties behind. And then what unintentionally happened was decision authority moved up. And so where we are focused right now is to ensure that the Air Force understands that the organizational chart of the United States Air Force has me and Secretary Wilson at the bottom and squadron commanders at the top. And our job is to make sure that they have what they need to succeed because that's where the mission of the United States Air Force is going to succeed or fail. We're building a new course for squadron command, for the squadron command teams, which consists of, of, of a continuum of learning to first identify and then prepare squadron command teams for this most essential level of command where we're going to succeed or fail as a service. And so you're going to see us continue to focus on this in the future. This is going to be a four-year effort to make sure that we, we emerge from this with healthy squadrons that are resources to accomplish the mission. Part of this we're gonna look at primarily across the active duty, but to a small extent perhaps in the guard, is to look at, okay, how many squadrons can we actually sustain that are healthy? Because if you look over time and you see the number of air, airmen that actually left the Air Force over time, upwards of 50,000, we actually didn't take down any flags, we added flags and squadrons while we took down the number of airmen. So we got a little bit of a mismatch right now, which is that we've got too many squadrons for the amount of manpower available to keep them healthy. So we're doing a look across the Air Force to make sure that squadrons are healthy for the future. I love these pictures. You know, the, the tools of warfare have changed over time. Ways of conducting warfare have changed over time. But here's what has never changed. Trust and confidence. Trust and confidence at the tactical level at the operational level, at the strategic level. This is George Marshall and Hap Arnold. And you go back and look at history, it's one of the most important relationships of trust and confidence that ever, ever occurred. These same relationships are being built on the battlefield today. It's not only being built between components, it's also being built internationally. I love the story of Major Mike Hostage and Major Mohammed Aish, Royal Saudi Air Force, who actually flew in formation together during Operation Desert Storm. And they grew up over their careers. Their families got to know each other. They kept in touch. They were friends. They'd fought together. And then they emerged at the end of their, towards the end of their careers as the Air Component Commander and the Chief of Staff of the Royal Saudi Air Force. That was a relationship of trust and confidence that had been invested in over time. Those same relationships are being built today. But for, United, for an airman, when we walk in to a room and we sit down at the table with our joint teammates, let me tell you something. They actually don't know what our badges mean. They don't care. They don't know whether these are flying wings or space wings or cyber wings. These are, these are internal badges for us. They're important to us, but they're not important to our joint teammates. When we walk in the room and sit at the table, what they see is United States Air Force. You understand air and space. You understand integration. You understand how to integrate joint fires. You understand how to integrate air and space power with land and maritime power. And of course, you, CFACs of the world. Of course you would be the Space Coordinating Authority because you're an airman. You own the ultimate high ground. That's the expectation of our joint teammates. We're looking at our development programs and our, cam and our campaign of learning that we have to ensure that all of us understand the operational art of air and space and how it comes together with the other components to do joint campaigning. 
We're rebuilding our JTF capacity within the United States Air Force. At 9th Air Force today, we're actually building a joint task force with a core headquarters that we will then can, can then place in the global response force to be able to have an offering to go forward to respond to crises as they occur. This is something that over 16 years of not being asked for, we traded it away a bit. And so it's time for us to build it back. Not to be in competition with anyone, but so that we can fulfill our commitment to the joint team. So that when a crisis occurs, they can look at any of the services for JTF resident capacity to be able to go in and handle a crisis. And we're looking very hard at how we build joint leaders of the future to ensure that we fulfill our obligations in the kind of conflict that I described for you in the future. Innovation. So what I've, what I've got on the slide here is are three commercial innovations that are actually fascinating when you look at them through the lens of military application for the future. Top left, show of hands, how many folks have ever done Uber? My security team hates it, but I do it. <laughs> so think about Uber. Uber is fascinating. It's a common operational picture displayed on your iPhone. And it's real time, updated. And you can actually pick what kind of modal transportation you want, immediately get feedback on the individual, the driver, the license plate, the kind of car. You can get a rating on what, how others have rated that individual. They can get a rating on you. Once you select, you can actually get a common intelligence picture of the battlefield as that driver actually drives all the way up to your location. It's fascinating technology. And my question for you is, is that personnel recovery in the future? Are we going to be able to Uber out? Why not? Middle picture, Virgin Galactic. Virgin Galactic has determined that that the highest cost of a rocket to go into orbit is actually from the surface to 50,000 feet because that's what you've got to have most of the fuel and that's where you have to have the rocket engines to be able to emerge away from the atmosphere and get into orbit. So let's launch it at 50,000 feet. Sounds a little bit like the Bell X-1. So they've created a mothership and they're within a year to two years away from being able to launch a small vessel into space with seven individuals that can then return from space at a low Earth orbit. What would that look like if we put seven special operators and we now have the capability militarily to get to anywhere on the planet in 45 minutes? Anywhere on the planet in 45 minutes. This is not Buck Rogers. This is, this is here. The question for us is, as we are working innovation of the future, how do we partner with industry on this really exciting technology? We just launched the X-37 on a SpaceX rocket into space. Elon Musk and SpaceX has determined that the highest cost of a rocket is the rocket motors in the first stage where the fuel is. So rather than dump it into the water like we have done over the years, they fly it back to the original point and land it one football field away from its original launch location. And having been out to Cape Canaveral and watched this in action, I tell you, it's fascinating. Eight seconds, be eight seconds before that thing hits the ground, three legs pop out and it lands to a perfect pinpoint landing, one football field away from where it, it launched. They let it lower it on its side, they wheel it, or put it on a train, put it into a, a, a warehouse, refuel the rockets, retool, they're gonna get, they're gonna, they're gonna get 10 launches out of that. 10 launches. The question is, what are we really looking at here? Are we looking at payload management with hypersonic reentry anywhere on the planet? Is this the next C-17? Why not? So this partnership that we have from industry, and as I look at the Air Force of the future in 2030, I predict that we'll be a force that is being, that, that's flying, fighting in space, that's operating in space. And so how do we ensure that we build the force now to get there? 
And then modernizing and strengthening our allies and partners and this, this business of multi-domain command and control. You know, this really comes down to the, how do you connect a sensing grid that I talked about and an effects grid and have that common operational picture and that, that decision speed that allows you to be able to produce so many dilemmas for your adversaries that in itself becomes deterrence in the 21st century. Many say that we already do this, and that's absolutely true. We already combine this together. And if you've ever been to the Air Operations Center in Al-Udeed, and many of you have served there, I will tell you it is state of the art. There is no parallel on the planet, and it is far too slow for the future. And we have got to think about this in new ways. How do we share data at the speed of light so that we can produce options that no adversary on the planet could ever match. The Rubik's Cube is not a bad way to think about this. There's, there's 18, I forget the term in terms of how many, like 18 zeros associated with the number of options available on a Rubik's Cube. So if every one of those color was a military capability, if every one of those color represented a domain, if every one of those colors represented a platform and a sensor, the question for us is, how do we now build so many different options that when you combine capabilities together in new ways, old things in new ways, new things in new ways, how do you combine these things in ways that a, in a resilient network can share information at a speed that allows us to get to the decision speed we need? And the center of that Rubik's Cube has got to be a common architecture. It's got to be a way that we share data. It's gonna be more and more about the data. I'm actually considering it in discussions right now on whether we as an Air Force ought to stand up software squadrons of coders. Young folks who actually understand how to manipulate code real time, immediately, and whether we actually need to look at IT information technology in completely new ways. Because in the old ways, we would, we would acquire IT as though it was a thing. In the new ways, you actually acquire it as though it's a journey. And this is a journey that never ends. And it's a journey that requires you to be able to update it real time and manipulate the data real time. And so this business of being able to share data to produce common operational picture and then decision speed and effects is going to be the centerpiece of warfare in the future for us to be able to fight and win. And we can never forget our, our moral obligation as airmen. Any soldier, sailor, airman, marine on the ground who ever hears jet noise overhead, they should never look up because they know it's us. That's an obligation that we have got to make sure that we can continue to fulfill. Admiral Richardson has, has coined a great phrase. You know, he says, hey, I don't think there, you know, we ought not be talking about anti-access area denial because, because it actually gives you a visual that somebody can put a block of wood over their country and we can't get in. The reality is no one can put that over their country. The best they can put over their country is a block of Swiss cheese. And like Swiss cheese, there are holes and it's our job to understand how to exploit them and get in and hold targets at risk and create dilemmas for the adversary. Air superiority has always got to be job one for the United States Air Force. And to our soldiers in the room, you can count on that from us. And let me just finish on this final story. This is a great... This is a great story just to tie it all together. So this is a uh, Slovenian uh, vessel, 800 feet long, that was delivering coal from Baltimore to uh, Slovenia. About 1,500 miles off of the east coast of Long Island, there was an explosion on board the vessel. Two individuals died, and several others were severely wounded. And the Air National Guard unit out of New York got the call. 
They ended up flying out, and they, because of weather, they couldn't jump out of the normal altitude of 3,400 feet. They had to jump out at 1,400 feet, inflated their zodiacs, got on board the vessel, had to do surgery because the airway of one of the victims was closing, and they had to open the airway with an immediate emergency tracheotomy. All of those victims survived to tell their tale. But here's the fascinating part of the story. This was playing on social media throughout Slovenia. And the mother of the president called the president of Slovenia and said, is there any chance, is there any hope? And the president of Slovenia said, Mom, if anybody can get there, the Americans will. Putting out fires. Taking care of the homeland. It's what you do. And so, as your chief of staff of the Air Force, let me just say I could not be prouder of this total force team. And as we go into the future, I couldn't be more excited about the technologies that industry is producing and the talent we have in our young airmen, like the great team that I've had the privilege to work with that General Rice offered up to me. And for the United States Air Force, the sky is no longer the limit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, test, test. Uh, Mike Duby uh, from Vermont. Chief, thank you for the inspiring words uh, for your leadership. Um, I'm going to ask a tactical level question. Yeah. Uh, we've heard a lot about the pilot shortage, and we're wondering what can we do to help. Yeah, thanks. So the here's the numbers right now in terms of, and, I'll, and I'd like to answer this, Mike, at a, let me tell you what, what we're trying to do nationally, where I could use your help, and what we're trying to do uh, jointly, because this is coming to a theater near everyone, uh, this pilot shortage. I mean, it's right now it's a crisis in the United States Air Force, but I, I believe um, it's coming to the Navy, the Army, the Marine Corps, and our international partners. And what we're doing internal to the Air Force, for all, I could also use your help. Uh, the reality is this. Here's the problem statement as I see it. Our nation does not produce enough pilots to service commercial, military, and business aviation. That's the problem statement. And so for the airlines right now, this is not necessarily a bad news story. And it's actually a story of a growing economy uh, to a certain extent that they need 4,500 pilots a year for the next 10 years, 4,500. We as a, a United States military produce 2,500 total across all of our services, of which half of those are in the United States Air Force. So, the, so we're attacking this on three levels. The first thing we're doing is we're, we're working with industry and not only the aviation industry, but also defense industry to say, okay, how do we get after this? This is a national challenge. And we're also working with, uh, with our legislators to say, all right, how do we make this easier? We gotta produce more pilots. How do we restore the luster of aviation? How do we get a national campaign going that gets into the high schools and talks to young kids about aviation and gets them fired? How do we get them airborne? How do we leverage the Civil Air Patrol? How do, we get a, how do we get a national campaign going that gets as many young people airborne as we can and talks to them about the fact that, hey, we're an aviation nation. You know, flying is cool. And then once we get them in the air, airplane, we get them hooked. How do we offset the costs of getting their license? Because right now, today, I will tell you, you better come from a wealthy family if you're going to get the 1,500 hours required to join an airline. And it's pretty straight math. 100 hour you know, wet rate in a Cessna 152 for you know, 1,500 hours costs you about 150 grand. That's a pretty significant student loan. So how do we as a nation put incentives in place to build up some flying academies, to use resources that we have available to get America fired up about producing pilots? That's number one. I can't do much of that. I can just try to plant seeds to see what can grow. You all can help me with that. Because I think there's great incentive for industry to help with that. Now, across the joint uh, force, what are we doing? Uh, 
mostly for the Air Force. This comes down to quality of service, quality of life. If, if we try to attack this with money alone, uh, there's no way. There's no way that I'm going to have the amount of money that the airline can offer in terms of the money loan. Now, we have done some important things. We've increased the aviation uh, bonus for the first time in, you know, in like 19 years. I mean, we've, we've done some pretty, and I really appreciate Congress's help with allowing us to do that. Because if we can take a financial burden off of a family, then that's great. But I'll tell you where I'm spending a lot of my time focused, and that's quality of service. How do we ensure that service as a pilot in the United States Air Force is as rich in experience for today's aviators as it was for those of us who stayed in and why we stayed in, right? How do we take care of families? How do we revitalize squadrons? How do we reduce in the irritants, you know? How do I ensure that when you're, you, when you're reporting in for weekend duty, that you don't spend upwards of 50% of your time doing ancillary training and irritating things that don't actually improve your readiness? How do I ensure that... And, and by the way, we're following the guards' lead on this. The guards actually in front of us in terms of getting rid of, um, of you know, bogus additional duties, ancillary training, those kind of things. So we're, we, the, 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 uh, the secretary and I have got a big, we got a big ax and we're swinging hard at this trunk. And by the way, we're not declaring victory. Uh, we know we got a lot of work to go, but we, we're, the way we look at it is 100 swings of the ax. And if we can continue to reduce irritants and increase the richness of being, uh, being a military pilot, then we're hoping that will stem the, stem the, the flow a little bit. And we gotta, get air, we gotta get pilots airborne, right? I mean, you know, after a while, if you're a pilot who doesn't fly, a maintainer doesn't maintain, an air traffic controller doesn't control, an air battle manager doesn't manage, at some point, you're gonna, you're gonna leave the company because we're not giving you the tools to be the very best that you could be. We're looking at all kinds of uh, incentive programs right now, I mean, and you're, you're going to see these rolling out nonstop. I mean, we, we just put out uh, the word that we're going to go to a second assignment in place program. We're about to uh, roll out, uh, um, you know, we're about to roll out a, 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 a new Air Force instruction or an adjustment, because we're trying not to put any new ones out. But we're put out in one that says, hey, crew rest now delegated to the squadron commander. Squadron commanders, you know, hey, look it, I, I, squadron, you know, they're, we trust squadron commanders with the most destructive weaponry on the planet. I think we can trust squadron commanders to determine whether their crew is rested. So we're going to push decision authority down and keep swinging at this, and my hope is that, that the force will give us a little time because we didn't get here overnight and we're not gonna reverse it overnight. And this is a journey that we're nonstop. All I can tell you is that the secretary and I are passionate about it and we're gonna get it as right as we can get it, as fast as we can get it. Thank you, Mike. Hey, sir. Pete Schneider from Louisiana here in the back. Hey, Pete. Uh, you talked, uh, appreciate you being here, giving us your vision as you take us uh, into the future. My question is, uh, is the C model part of that future? Uh, <laughs> what is your, you know, are we going to slap it, or are we going to look for something else? Yeah. Uh, you're talking about F-15C? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, so here's the, here's, the, here's the challenge. I'm going to try not to, as respect, I'm not going to dodge your question, but let me give you a little bit of a framework in terms of where I'm comfortable talking, right? Uh, the process is that we are just starting with the 19 Palm, and the Secretary of Defense hasn't actually had a chance to even look at it yet. So we're in this beginning of a dialogue relative to the, rel the various changes. Right now, the F I can tell you that right now the F-15C is part of the inventory and will stay in the inventory for some period of time. Now, um, that doesn't mean, uh, again, because uh, I don't ever want to stand on this stage and tell you something and then, uh, that I can't deliver on, right? The reality is I don't know what's going to happen with this budget. I, don't, I, can't, I can't predict up here right now whether we're going to actually get relief from sequestration. And if we go down to sequestration again, hey, let's, let's be honest with each other, right? Uh, 2013 was a really, really bad year for, uh, for the teamwork between the active duty and the International Guard and the United States Air Force. 
And I love the way my predecessor, Chief Welsh, talked about it during AFA. He said, you know, we're like the, he said, you know, hey, we're like the Air Force Memorial, you know, three spires, right? And he said, you know, here we were, we were closing in on each other, we're a close formation, we're flying together, we're doing good. All of a sudden we hit 2013 and we sort of went after each other and we did a bomb burst, right? And then he said, but it's okay, we're still visual. We can get back together. And he spent four years, and I give him so much credit. That's why we named the One Air Force Award after you know, the Welsh family. He pulled us back together in formation. We gotta commit to each other right here now that, that, that even worst case, if sequester happens, and the devastation that that brings, my commitment to you as your chief is that we're not gonna have another bomb burst. We're gonna work this through, we're gonna work this through this together. But there's going to be a lot of tough choices we're going to have to make. And so, you know, the answer to the 15C question is really based on, hey, what is this budget going to look like? Do we get stable budgets in the future? You know, if, you're, if you have one impact, you know, I, I, learned a, I learned a great lesson when I was the wing commander at Holloman Air Force Base. I mean, I was a brand new one star. I was somebody. And I went to visit the governor in New Mexico. And it just so happened when I went to meet him, the, the commander of the Taco Guard was there. Jay Bledsoe was there as well. And so I walked in and met the governor, said, hey, Mr. Governor, sir, how you doing? He goes, I'm, I'm Brigadier General Dave Goldfein. You know, I'm, I'm one of your highest ranking guys in all of the state of New Mexico. You know, good to see you. And, uh, and then uh, I remember Jay, Jay was there. The governor says, hey, looks at me and says, man, I hope our, our wives aren't going to do much damage out when they're out shopping today. I remember thinking, huh, that's interesting. And then the conversation went to the, and when's your daughter coming over to babysit tonight? All right, so I'm, I'm the one-star full-time wing commander at Holloman, and Jay, okay, so here's the lesson for me. Who's the full-timer and the part-timer in that discussion? <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> Make no mistake, I'm the part-timer, right? Because I'm in and out two years, year and a half, right? They're there to stay. What would it look like what, what would our Air Force look like as we, as we move towards 2030? What would our Air Force look like if we actually truly captured the power of what the Air National Guard brings in terms of the message? What if, what if everyone wearing blue in this room truly felt ownership of space? Because that's what our joint teammates expect of us. And when we go on the hill, every one of us in blue is fighting to make sure that we can fight and win in space. What would that look like if we actually harnessed the power of the total force in that way? Uh, I personally think we'd be unstoppable. Thanks, Pete. General, uh, my name is Captain Ryan McLean, 113th ASOS, Indiana Air Guard. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to actually uh, point you to a bit of good news. We've actually been executing uh, Uber-like pickups, like you mentioned, with an AFRL developed at uh, ATAC. Uh, but on to my two questions. Um, so first of all, in the context of battlefield airmen, uh, how do you see multi-domain command and control over the next five, 10 years affecting like, that battlefield autonomy? And then uh, as a follow-on, how does that bubble up to like the Joint Force Commander and, and affect day-to-day -day operations in theater? Man, per time, perfect question, and here's why. So right now, we are in the middle of a battlefield airman force improvement program, and uh, General Wooster is actually the senior mentor for this team, led by a general officer, going out there to visit every base where we're doing battlefield airman training, and where battlefield airmen uh, are living, and to, to identify where is it that we need to put resources to ensure that not only are we prepared for the fight today, but more importantly, where are we headed for tomorrow? So one of the briefings that's gonna to come to Corona uh, here in a, in a few weeks, when we go up to, when we get the four stars all together at, uh, we in the fall, we do it in Colorado Springs, is Battlefield Airmen 2030. Because you know how we have these discussions about, hey, what about, what about combat search and rescue? You know, does it belong in soft? Does it belong in ACC? Does it belong in soft? Does it belong in ACC, right? And every time we have this discussion, you know, it, I mean, uh, you know, if we proved one thing, it's we can do it both ways. That's not the question. The question is, where are we headed in 2030? 
Where do our battle of airmen feel fit? How do we ensure that we are fully resourcing those who, quite frankly, in many of the fights that we are in and are going to face, also face the highest risk? How do we ensure, you may have heard this, and I'll tell you that we're not where I need, where we need to be yet, but my, my policy as your chief is that for a battlefield airman, if it touches your body, we are not going to accept any risk, any risk. We know how to actually issue personalized gear. We know how to pour helmets. We know how to personalize vests for exactly what you need to carry. We, need to have, we, know, we know actually how to reduce the size of batteries. We know how to get rid of cables that keep hanging people up when they're jumping in out of helicopters. We know how to get you personalized gear. We know how to do this in the United States Air Force. I will tell you, we have not done it to my satisfaction for our battlefield airmen. That's part of the force improvement program as we're going forward. So I'm really interested in getting, it'll be a team briefing in, in a few weeks from Air Combat Command and Air Force Special Operations Command commanders. They're gonna team brief this and we're gonna make some decisions on where we're going for the future.